Hi, I'm Dave, and I'm the lead pastor here at New Life. And I just want to welcome you to our service. For me, there's no better place to be. And if you'd like to know more information about how to connect and different things that are going on, make sure you check down below. And hit that like button, hit that subscribe button so you can see new services as they come online. So now, rather than sitting around, let's join in. without hope but no place to begin your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested my life began and ash was redeemed only beauty remains my orphan heart was given a name my morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance. When death was arrested, my life began. Oh, your grace, so free, washes over. From my chains, I'm a prisoner no more. My sin was a ransom he faithfully bore. And he canceled my debt and he called me.
So I would like to ask this question to start off with. Well, first I want to say I was talking to my wife last night about the message today, and <clears throat> she basically, after listening to me to, to me for a while, said, you know, really, I mean, boil it down to it. It's just um, you just stand up there and say, hey, you know, we just all need Jesus. So in closing, let's pray. <laughs> Thanks for laughing at that cheesy joke. Um, she really did say that, but uh, I got a little bit more to share with you. Is that okay? Okay. So how many of you have, uh, growing up, had older siblings? Anybody? Show me your hands. Yeah. It's rough, right? How many were the youngest in your family? Yeah. That's really hard, right? We've been through a lot. We've been through a lot. Uh, older siblings telling us we're spoiled and... Um, I don't know why, but there's one of the main phrases I remember coming from my oldest brother was, if that was my kid, I don't know what that means, but, um, but one thing, the other memory I have of his, and, and, and I'm sure he did a lot of great things, but, but some things stick with you, right? So he, um, let me start with this, preface it by saying, because of nothing that I did, I was completely innocent in this. There were times where he would get me on the floor, sit on top of my stomach, and he would take one of my arms and put it under one knee and the other arm put it under the other knee, and then he would do this. And, you know, a couple of taps, no big deal. But after like five straight minutes or 10 minutes of that, you feel like it's starting to drill a hole to your backbone, you know, it's just like, ah. And I just remember that feeling of, of just like, I'm helpless, I'm stuck, I, I can't move, I can't do anything, I have no defense whatsoever. You know, all I can do is the only defense the youngest have. And what do we say? Mom, right? But he had a way of doing it when she wasn't around. So, um, but I just remember how, how just extremely helpless and trapped I felt. And for me, in my experience, that's kind of what anxiety feels like. Um, I don't know if you've experienced anxiety. I think most of us have in one form or another. We've felt worried or nervous or, or extremely fearful about something. And so this, this series is all about moving forward through the stuck places in our lives, through the things that are kind of holding us down or holding us back. Last week, Pastor Dave talked about forgiveness. If you haven't heard that message, you should listen to it online because, um, or maybe you shouldn't because it might rock your world a little bit, but it is a powerful message about what God can do to help us work through forgiveness. Um, so today, uh, we're gonna begin uh, to, to look at this idea of how can God help us through anxiety? And I bet more than a few of us have experienced that type of fear that is gripping, um, that worry and anxiety that brings with it a sense of impending doom. Like it sends us into a state of panic sometimes. Maybe our muscles are tightening, our sweat glands are working overtime, and our mind is racing, and we're feeling like we're trapped. Feeling like, I have, I have no control over this. It's just something that's happening to me. It's like a wave that is just pounding over me and I, I got nothing to do. I, I, don't, I don't know how to help. So we're searching for help, some way that we can break loose, some way that we can, like we sang today, it's some way that we can stand um, with everything else going on. And sometimes it can feel like nobody else really cares about what we're going through. And sometimes we're afraid to even tell anybody. Um, sometimes it's like no one could actually help even if we did tell them. We, we have doubts that feel like roaring lions and, and we look down and it feels like our faith is like a toothpick trying to fight off those, those thoughts. So what do we do? What do we do when our thoughts are anxious, when anxiety begins to just kind of be this thing that holds us down or holds us back from where we know we need to be, what we need to do, who we need to talk to, or what we need to go and, and be. Um, I want to start by saying that 
I'm not going to be able to stand here today and give you three easy, easy steps that all of a sudden takes away all anxiety and you'll never wrestle with it again. So if you have that expectation, sorry, that's not me. That's not what I can do today. But what I do believe is as we look at the scripture together that we can learn some things, some tangible things that we can do, whether we're feeling totally pinned down or whether it's just that anxiety is something that keeps tripping us up. And if you deal with anxiety at all, obviously this message is for you. If you feel like you don't have any anxiety, you're just like Mr. or Miss Chill, get out. We don't, we don't no, I'm just kidding. We, we, I think that this is for you too. Because, well, for one thing, I don't mean to make you anxious, but you probably will deal with anxiety sometime in your life. But, but also just to, for understanding and for, to have compassion and grace for those who do struggle with anxiety. Because um, some of these things, you, you just don't know it until you've been in it, right? Um, and so that's important as well. It, but I, what is it about anxiety? It feels like something that maybe we just resign ourselves and I guess this is just my new normal, Mr. You know, anxious. And let me stop and say that, that I deal with this, that I deal with anxiety. I, uh, I feel like panic is coming on sometimes. So I, I get maybe what you face, if, if that's something you face. And I wanna tell you that that doesn't make you a bad Christian. It doesn't make you somehow less than as a follower of Christ, okay? If you take medication for anxiety, that doesn't make you a bad Christian or less than in the body of Christ. I take medication for anxiety and depression. So I'm not saying that to kind of go, oh, look at me. I'm just saying like, it's okay. If you were sick, you would take medicine, right? Physically sick. Or maybe if you broke something, you'd go to the doctor. Well, things we deal with mentally are really no different than those things. They're things that we need to look for help with. So those are some things that can help. But if you, you know as well as I do that going to a counselor, as great as that is, that's actually something I'm going into, that that's, that's helpful. It can be helpful. Taking medication, it can be helpful. But none of those, there's no such thing as a magic pill that just do this or just take that or just go here and all of a sudden it just all disappears. It's a process, like what Pastor Dave talked about last week with, with forgiveness, that it's not a like, okay, now I have perfect forgiveness for all those who hurt me. No, it's a process that we have to walk through. And so that's why this is called forward, not arrival. And because we're moving forward. In Celebrate Recovery, we talk about, it's about progress, not perfection. Perfection is one of those things, by the way, that causes anxiety that we think we have to be perfect. That's me. So I believe that God actually wants to bring us peace. You believe that? That his name, one of, his names of, one of the names of Jesus is the Prince of Peace. So if the Prince of Peace has made his home in me and you, doesn't it make sense that one of the things he would bring with him is peace when he moves in. But how do we live that? How do we experience that? How do we bring that into our everyday life? How do I have the type of relationship with God that, um, that helps me to experience his peace? This is what Jesus said to his followers. followers. He said, I am leaving you with a gift. Peace of mind and heart. And the peace that I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. It sounds really good, and I know it's true, but what do I do if I'm still anxious even when I read that scripture? If you open your Bible, we're going to look at a story, a true story, <clears throat> from the book of Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, verse 35 we're going to read this story, and if you've been in church very long, or if you've gone to VBS or Sunday school, you've heard this story. Um, but I'm, I'm hoping that God will kind of use this story today to teach us a little bit more about what we can do to, to have anxiety begin to fade and to let us start to move towards peace. 
we're going to look at some things that we can do. So in Mark chapter 4, verse 35, it starts off like this. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats followed. But soon, but soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. And the disciples woke him, woke him up shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? I think this part already is hilarious. Because it was Jesus' idea to go on this boat journey, right? So keep in mind, I mean, this isn't really a thing to, that I put on your sheet, but sometimes God leads us into areas where it doesn't seem like it was a good idea to go. Sometimes he, he allows us to walk or even leads us into something that's going to be a challenge. So they get out onto this lake. And I don't know if you've ever been on a body of water when a storm hits, but it is not fun. Um, I, I imagine it's not fun. I have never been out there, but um, I do have, like, I, we, were in, uh, we were in Israel a couple years ago, and this was the Sea of Galilee. It's kind of hard to tell, but it was storming like crazy. This is during the day, and um, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, this, the wind started howling, and the waves started coming over um, onto the, the area where the hotel was, knocking over chairs and stuff like that. And it was like, oh, okay. And it's a storm that happens maybe like once in every 10 years there. And I could imagine being out on a boat like that, going, we're going to go down, and looking back in the back of the boat, and Jesus' head is on a cushion, and he's, he's snoring, going, this is like I'm getting rocked to sleep. It's great. It's fantastic. It's a nice, cool mist in the air. It's great. And the disciples are going nuts, right? And then Jesus stands up, and he says, peace be still. And then it does this. Imagine what that would have been like. I to have this scary, out of control, totally terrifying thing, and boom, it's gone. Of course, they don't know that yet in this story. They wake Jesus up from his nice little beauty sleep, and they say these words to him. Actually, they shout these words to him. Teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? Sometime in the next month or so, if there's somebody asleep at your house, like taking a nap, I encourage you to try waking them up like that and see what happens. I'll be like, let me help you into the water. So the disciples were afraid, and, and understandably so, right? They, they, they'd probably been out, they've seen boats go down, they've heard the stories of people who drown in this, in this lake, and... Um, and, and it makes sense. I mean, fear is a real feeling. It's, it's a genuine emotion that, uh, that we can feel when something is threatening us, right? It sometimes can save our life. Fear can actually be a healthy thing. Um, and, you know, there's, there's things that make sense to be afraid of. Like, you know, if there's growling Rottweilers or pit bulls that are running after you. I know pit bulls are nice. Don't, you don't have to come and talk to me afterwards. But, you know, imagine if they're not being nice at that moment. But, you know, imagine these growling dogs come for you or like you're, you're at a football game and there's Raiders fans. I mean, that's a reason <laughs> to be afraid, right? And I am, I am one, so. Um, but just imagine, you know, the last time you were afraid, the thing that scared you out of your wits for a second. Um, I remember thinking I was alone one night at my house when I was a kid and running around, nobody was answering. And I literally ran up to the back door and saw a face in the window and screamed and like fell backwards. It was my face. <laughs> I don't know what that says, but. But anxiety takes it a step further. Anxiety is more than just a fear, a valid fear. Anxiety takes it to the nth degree. It takes it to the, the, the horrible end, the, the imagined outcome 
where it starts to become this thing that's debilitating, right? That holds us down, that keeps us back, that limits us. It becomes this obsession. It becomes something that we, we take fear to its extreme conclusion. And we know that it might not disappear in one day, but we also know that God has a way of helping us with our anxiety. So number one is this. Anxiety fades, begins to fade when, when I fully trust in God's care. What did the disciples say to Jesus? Don't you care that we drown? Now, the boat was still afloat. Yes, there was water coming into the boat, and generally that's seen as a bad thing. But it was still afloat. They weren't going down yet. But they had already decided in their mind, this is how we die. Have you been in one of those situations where you're driving or you're somewhere and you're like, oh, this is how it's going to happen. That's what they were thinking. They were thinking, we're done for. And they went over to Jesus, and it's not like they thought he could actually fix it. You could look in verse 41 and see that he, they didn't really believe he could fix it. But it was that they wanted him to be awake for his own death. Right? It would be horrible to sleep through your drowning. They, actually, what they're saying is, we don't think you care. Like, how how could you sleep? And I wonder how many times that I have or you have been in that situation where it's like, God, don't you care? Don't you care? Because we're, we're not seeing him take action. We're not seeing him answer the prayer the way we think it should be answered. We're, we're not seeing him intervene where, the way that we want him to intervene, right? It's like, God, do you care? That's a pretty hard place to be. How many times have we been in a super difficult situation and we're looking for answers, we're praying, but it seems like God's not listening. It's a pretty hard thing to think about, right? If, if the God who made me doesn't see me, doesn't hear me, doesn't care about me. Regardless of how it feels in that moment, the truth is he does care. The truth is he does love you. He does see us. He does hear our prayers. Peter addressed it this way. He said, give all your worries and and cares to God for he cares about you. You say, well, if he really cared about me, he'd do this. We have these expectations sometimes for God and it feels like he's letting us down sometimes. What do we do in that situation? To know, to know, to know that the truth is, is he does care. And the truth is, he is ready to act on our behalf. We give all our cares to God. How do we do that? What does that look like? Well, I mean, the obvious answer is, is we pray, right? That's one of the main ways. But it's not, it doesn't end there. Because here's the thing. When you're done praying, what do you do after the amen? Do we go and try to handle it on our own? Do we try to just muscle through it with our own strength? Or at the amen, do we say, and now I'm going to trust you. And now I'm going to wait. We all love waiting, don't we? Like we just think like, oh, what's the longest line we can get in? We hate waiting. Every single one of us hate waiting. You know, our computers can never be fast enough. It wouldn't matter if the search like found the answer before we entered it in. We'd be like, oh, why didn't it come yesterday? It's this feeling of like, oh, he's got to have it right now. And sometimes God's not, sometimes God's saying no. Sometimes God's saying yes. Sometimes he's saying, trust me. Wait. So one of the ways that we can do this is called breathing prayers. And it's not just an exercise some psychologists came up with. It's literal prayers. But it is the act of breathing in 
deep breath and then breathing out, Lord, I know you care. Here's my family. I'm putting my cares in your hands. Here's my job. Here's my relationship. Here's my marriage. Here's world politics. <laughs> Here's my coworkers. God, whatever it is, I give it to you. And there's something, you know, you know, physical and mental and emotional and spiritual. It, we're all, it's all connected. We're not a bunch of different compartments. So sometimes the things we do physically affect our faith and our emotions too. So breathing out that prayer, saying, God, I'm, I'm putting this in your hands. It can make a big difference. I'm giving you my worries about my health because I know you care for me. I've given you my worries about my kids, given you my worries about my job, about my school, about my relationship. I've given you my worries that just flood my mind, God, today, because I know you care about me. And then we take the next step of saying, God, or not, I mean, after the amen of, of committing, of resolving inside of ourselves that we're going to depend on him. We're going to wait for his answer. So as I fully trust in his care, my anxiety starts to become less. They yell, they yell this accusation at Jesus. You know, don't you care if we drown? And then it says when Jesus woke up, which I'm sure he did if they're yelling this at him, he rebuked them. No, he didn't. He didn't say to them, hey, calm down because we know how helpful that is, right? Have you ever been super stressed or anxious or whatever and somebody says, hey, 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 calm down. It's really helpful, right? Your answer is usually, oh, thank you. That's all I needed. <laughs> no, no. Jesus dealt with something tangible to help them see that he cared about them and to help them understand that Having him in your boat makes all the difference. Imagine if these disciples had been out on the storm without Jesus. What would they have done? Jesus probably would have got more sleep. But he got up and he addressed the problem. Sometimes we get all caught up in all of the exterior and all the side things. And sometimes we need to go back to what's actually the problem here. He says, silence, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. So remember how he described the waves? They were fierce. But listen to how he describes the calm. It's great. It is great. Not just your average calm here, guys. This is like great calm. Awesome calm. Have you ever met somebody just like, I mean, have you ever met somebody who can actually talk to the wind and the waves and be like, hey, shut up? And it happens. Well, yeah, if you've met Jesus, you have met somebody who can do that. He did it here. He still has that power today. And the wind and the waves that are in our lives, whatever they are, he still has the ability to bring peace to those. He still can calm the storm. Notice, God cares about you. But even knowing that, and even knowing that his care is real, why do we still experience anxiety? Well, number two is this. Anxiety begins to fade when I truly engage with God's power. I truly, like, grab on, latch on, and depend on his power. I wait on his power to come through. When I was in Wyoming, I bought a green 67 VW Beetle. I loved that car. Um, it wasn't pretty. It wasn't all re restored, but it was so much fun. Uh, although in Wyoming in the winter, you have to have an ice scraper for the inside of the windshield as well as the out because your breath freezes. It's great. I do not miss that weather at all. But one of the issues with that car was that um, it would jump out of, it would pop out of second gear. So, you know, put the pedal to the floor and you get up to five miles an hour and then you shift it into second and you're trying to drive and all of a sudden it would pop 
right out of second gear. And um, so the engine would be revving all that huge power, 1600 cc's of power in a VW bug, and, uh, but, but I would be slowing down. So it's like the, the engine's running, it's going, it's getting gas, but it's not in gear. So I wonder if we could be honest and say, does that happen with me and my faith sometimes? Does that happen sometimes where it just sort of pops out of gear and I start kind of doing it on my own and I forget that God's power is something he wants to make evident in my life? And I don't know the answers. I don't have them all as far as like why in one case he does a miracle and in another case it, it seems like something else happens, you know, and, and what's all going on with that? He's God, I'm not. That's what I have to end up with. But I know that I've seen it myself. I heard a story about it this morning about somebody's mom who was headed towards passing away and God turned that around. Now, are they still gonna go to be with the Lord at some point? Yeah, but not now. So why is that miracle? How does that happen? It's, it's when we engage with God's power? How do we find relief from stress and anxiety? It's when we engage with God's power. Think about God's kingdom for a second. Jesus talked about it 53 times in the book of Matthew. And what did he say about his kingdom so many times? He talked about it being close. It says it's within your reach. So it's not just heaven someday. Oh yeah, you know, I'll talk about God's kingdom as heaven. But God wants to rule and reign in our life right now. His kingdom is where he invites us into, not just about borders and palaces. It means his realm, his rule, his authority. Jesus talked about his kingdom so much because he wanted those who followed him to live, <coughs> to live their lives a different way to view their lives through a different lens, no longer through the oppressive and dark and evil lenses of of, uh, the evil regime, the devil, but through freedom and wholeness and the power of God's heavenly kingdom. When we engage God's power, we see a difference that only God can make. So how do we engage? Well, let's read on and find out. (coughs) Excuse me. It says, then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? And the disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? Who is this man, they asked each other. Even the wind and waves obey him. And I know it feels a little bit like Jesus is like, frustrated. Like, why are you afraid? That's that's why I always saw it. Like, why are you afraid? Don't you have any faith? But to me, what he's saying is, there's something more that you're missing. There's something greater that you're not experiencing with me. There's something more that I have for you. That's more. Something that drives away fear, drives away worry and anxiety. And it's me, Jesus was saying. It's me. It's who I am. He didn't say, you guys don't have faith, so you should be ashamed of yourselves. Or he didn't say, your faith is too small. You know, you, if, you, if your faith was bigger, you would have made these, these, these waves go away yourself. He didn't say that to them. He said, why are you afraid? You know, how many, your faith is missing. You forgot to bring it with you. He's telling them, honestly, faith is, is the answer for fear. See, if if faith is missing, it's like having no immune system when fear comes along, when worry comes along. It's like we have no resistance. And then the disciples, when when they look at what Jesus has done, I don't know if they heard anything he said because it just says they were absolutely terrified. And their first thought was, I thought I knew who Jesus was, but (laughs) who is this? Who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. 
this encounter revealed a whole new reality about Jesus. The rabbi that they thought they knew before just showed himself to be somebody that they had no clue that he could do. It's like when the, you know, when the, when the littlest guy on the team scores the winning shot or, or the smallest person runs the fastest race or, or whatever it is, it's something that comes out of nowhere. That's the way they felt. So the last step that we'll talk about today is anxiety begins to fade when I genuinely know and trust Jesus. Now, don't flip that around and use it as some kind of condemning thing. Oh, I don't, I have anxiety, so it means I don't genuinely know and trust Jesus. See this as an invitation. See it as an invitation. How do you see Jesus? How do you view him? How do you think of him? Jesus actually asked his disciples this, didn't he? He asked, hey, who do people say that I am? And they're like, oh, you're this prophet or whatever. And then he turns it up to them and says, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? I wonder if he's asking some of us that same question this morning. Who do you say that Jesus is? It's a good question. It's because lots of people know about God. Maybe even they know a lot about the Bible. Most of our population believes that God exists. But I don't know if that's enough faith to actually bring peace in the storms. James said, you say you have faith for you believe that there is one God. Good for you. Even the demons believe this and they tremble in terror. So let me ask you again, what do you truly believe? I had a professor in college that said, we'll only live what we truly believe. So what you and I truly believe about Jesus will guide our decisions and impact our relationships. He's not, he didn't come to just set up a religion. He didn't come to just espouse some new philosophy. Jesus came to introduce himself to us. And it's a relationship with him that he's looking for. Not just a set of beliefs, but a relationship. My mom called me last night and she sang a song I hadn't heard in a while. And one line from that just stuck out to me with this. It just goes, what friend we have in Jesus. Do you think of him that way? Do you see him as your friend? Somebody you can count on? Somebody that you look to when you're making decisions? Somebody that you you look to when you're going through something? Somebody that you thank when something good happens? Simon Peter answered this. He said, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus basically says, good answer, Peter. (laughs) That's gonna be the foundation of the whole movement that's gonna happen when I'm gone. The Messiah, son of the living God. Have we moved past thinking of God, thinking of Jesus as a, as a good teacher who started a good religion? Maybe we need a who is this guy moment. Maybe we need God to show up in such a powerful way that we just go, oh, I thought I knew him. But there's so much more. This is not putting down anybody who has just the beginning as a faith. That's awesome. It's beautiful. But we don't stay there, right? We don't keep wearing our baby's clothes for all of our life. We grow and we change. And our faith needs to grow. Maybe we need to pray this prayer. Jesus, show me who you really are. Help me to come to a place where I am fully trusting in you. Here's how Paul wrote about anxiety and worry. He says, don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you'll experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. 
What did he say his peace would do? Guard our hearts and our minds. That sounds awesome. So pray about everything. Thank God for what he's done. This is the first step when we're feeling trapped by anxiety and worry. Truly knowing who Jesus is and that he cares about us and that he can guard our hearts and and minds with his peace. So remember what he's done. This is who he is. It's, It's the truth. Truth deflates anxiety. Think about anxiety. It's based on all these things that are imagining. We need to come back to what is true. Jesus is true. He cares about me. That's true. He's powerful. He's bigger than this. That's true. These are things that we could start to like, kind of like dwell on in our minds to help the anxiety become smaller. Listen to Jesus' own words about worry. He says, this is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life. Whether you have enough food or drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? And you look around our society today and people might say, nope, that's pretty much it. Well, maybe one or two other things. But he's saying, look, look, at, look at all this around you. Look at the, when you see a bird, go, wow, God cares more about me than that bird. If you, if you see a flower, go, wow, God dressed that. I don't have to worry about what I'm going to wear. He could take care of me. So as we, as we wrap this up today, let me ask you this. Where do you have anxiety in your life? In a sense, I'm asking you, what are your waves? And what's your wind? Where's the storm that you have? Maybe it's huge and everybody is, uh, can, can tell that you're going through it. Maybe it's something very private that nobody knows but you. But what, what are your wind and waves? I want you to think about it. Think about what it would like, what it would be like for Jesus to bring peace to that area. And we can pray things like, Jesus, I know that I trust you. I know you care and I I trust you with my, my wind and waves, whatever that is for you. Lord, I trust you with my fear and worry. Lord, I trust you with my grief and despair, with my addiction and shame, with my loneliness and isolation, with my struggling marriage, with my children, with my coworkers, with my neighbor, with my own thoughts. God, I trust you with those. If you deal with anxiety, I wanna ask you to pray this prayer with me and you can do it, you can do it silently or out loud. Pray this prayer, repeat after me. Jesus, I trust you with my, you fill in the blank trust you with my wind and waves. Jesus, I know you care for me. I know you're more than powerful enough to bring me peace. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord, for each person that's here today. Lord, I pray that somehow, some way, um, you spoke into each heart. And God, that you gave some people hope today that they could actually experience your peace. God, the one or two or whoever that's feeling overwhelmed and attacked by anxiety and thoughts and stuff, God, just, we know you care, God, would you please, would you please speak peace to that situation into that person's heart and mind, that you just guard them. God, you see the needs, you see the struggles, and you are not blind to them. You are not deaf to the prayers. God, help us to rely on you. Help us to walk out of here and not just try to handle it, not just try to do the best we can and struggle through, but God, that we would truly, completely surrender it to you. And we wouldn't live in all the what ifs What if this happens? What if that happens? What if I'm not enough? What if, but God, we'd see that you call us your own children and you says we're masterpieces. 
So God, today we rely on you. We trust in your grace and your love for us. And we thank you that you are able to bring peace and calm to the wind and waves in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you stand with me today? I'd like to pray this, a prayer of blessing over you from Psalms 91. And it goes like this. May you live in the shelter of the Most High. May you find rest in the shadow of the Almighty. May you be able to declare about the Lord that he alone is your refuge, your place of safety, your God, and that you trust him. For he will rescue you from every trap and protect you from deadly disease. He will cover you with his feathers. He, he will shelter you with his wings. His faithful promises are your armor and protection. Amen. Amen. God bless you. If you'd like some prayer, we'll be down in front ready to pray with you. Make sure you stop by the info center. Talk to the people at the Rhythms table. Have a great day. Great, blessed week, okay?